Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Laurel Westendorf, part of the Community Relations Team at the Deschutes Public Library. Today's presentation is Magnificent Monarchs with Amanda Egertson. Amanda is the Deschutes Land Trust Stewardship Director and oversees the management of all of the Land Trust protected lands. Amanda has a BA in Elementary Education in Music and an MS in Animal Ecology with a research focused on songbirds and butterflies. She leads butterfly tours often with her kids on land trust preserves and is guiding land trust work with regional monarch conservation. Thank you so much for joining us, Amanda, to share about this lovely and intrepid migrant species. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to share this magnificent world with everybody. Okay, before I launch into the world of monarchs, uh, just a brief intro to the Deschutes Land Trust. I've been working there for a little over 16 years. Uh, the Land Trust is celebrating our 25th anniversary this year, which is really exciting. We've been working hard to conserve land throughout Central Oregon for wildlife, communities, and scenic views and uh, thanks to everybody listening for those of you that have been supporting us through the past 25 years and if you haven't checked us out please do so on facebook instagram our website uh, to learn more about us and uh, be part of our uh, awesome family as we move into the next 25 years Okay, so today the focus is monarchs. I'm going to start by actually introducing you to some common Central Oregon butterflies that are often confused with monarchs. We'll talk about some butterfly basics and how a butterfly becomes a butterfly, and then we'll dive deep into the amazing world of monarchs. So I always like to start off uh, these talks by asking folks how many butterflies they think we have in Central Oregon, how many different species. And typically, uh, people come back with somewhere between 25 to 50. And I'm happy to report that we actually have about 130 different types of butterfly species here in Central Oregon. And that is due to the incredible diversity of habitats that we have. If you think about the Badlands, to the High Cascades, to the beautiful Metolius River Corridor, there are so many different kinds of plants in all those different places and with the different plants come different types of butterflies and we'll talk more about that uh, special link in a little bit. So I'd like to just start by touching on the ones that the butterfly species here in Central Oregon that get confused with monarchs. First one is the Western Tiger Swallowtail. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this butterfly. We see it all over town and also in the mountains, in the woods, wherever you might be wandering. Um, the main difference between the Western Tiger Swallowtail and the Monarch, you can see, is that the Swallowtail, the background color is a brilliant buttery yellow, and the Monarch is orange. So they both have some black markings. They're both very large butterflies, um, but it's yellow versus orange. That's the thing to cue into. Another one that often gets confused with monarchs, and I'll get phone calls like, I saw thousands of monarchs uh, when I was, you know, going over the summit to the valley or when I was out on a trail. I wish there were thousands of monarchs here at the same time uh, in Central Oregon, but sadly there are not. Uh, these are uh, California tortoise shells, super common. Uh, this butterfly goes through natural population cycles, booms and busts, and so for several years in a row, you'll see hordes of them. Um, and then for you know another few years, there won't be as many. Um, but we have the side-by-side -side pictures there on the right side of your screen, so you can see uh, the California tortoise shell on top and the monarch down below. The tortoise shell is quite a bit smaller. Um, and it has jaggedy um, wing margins. You see that sort of jaggedy edge and a very dark coloration when it closes its wings, which you can see on the photo to the left uh, when they're resting on a trail. Uh, you see how dark it is. And actually, that's a super cool camouflage uh, adaptation because they spend a lot of time in forests. And so when they close their wings and land on a tree, they totally blend in with the bark. It's really cool. Another one commonly confused with monarchs is the painted lady. These guys also go through natural population cycles and some summers I see a lot of them and then there'll be summers where I don't see a single one. Uh, these again, quite a bit smaller than a monarch and they don't have that really strong black veining that you see in the monarch. But you can see they are similar. I definitely understand why people confuse them. 
Another one is the red admiral. These are really friendly butterflies. Uh, you might see them in your backyard or around downtown in Bend or Sisters, uh, Redmond, Prineville. They're sort of all over the place, but you see that really large central area of brown. That's a dead giveaway that it's not a monarch when you compare the side-by-side -side photos there. Uh, the red admiral doesn't have the strong black veining and it just has that big blob of dark in the middle. Okay, now a fun thing that you can do with monarchs that you can't do with a lot of other butterfly species is tell the difference between the male and the female. There are so many species we have here in Central Oregon where you have absolutely no idea whether you're looking at a boy or a girl, but with monarchs, it's super easy to tell. And you see this arrow on the screen is pointing to a black dot that the male has on both hind wings there. And that dot is actually made up of a bunch of uh, scales that release pheromones to attract the ladies. So here is the male with the dots and the female uh, without the dots. And she, as you can see, see has much thicker black veining. So that's a little tip on how to tell the difference if you're lucky enough to spot one. Okay, some fun butterfly facts that I think is uh, good for everybody to know. Butterflies can smell with their antenna. This is a beautiful shot of a spring azure. They can taste with their feet, which is a pretty cool deal if you spend a lot of time walking around on flowers and they carry around a drinking straw everywhere they go. They're very environmentally conscious. Uh, it's called a proboscis, and it rolls up when it's not in use, and when a butterfly lands on a flower and wants to sip nectar, it just unfurls it, dips it down into the flower, and sucks up the nectar. Butterflies are also solar powered. That's why you don't see them flying around when it's cloudy or rainy. Uh, you don't see them typically flying around in the winter time unless it's an unseasonably warm day. They need the um, heat of the sun to warm up their flight muscles. And they also do a cool thing. They, they often don't get everything they need from flowers. So uh, all the nutrients that they need. So you'll often see them puddling. It's, it's what we call a collection of butterflies. Um, and you see this a lot with the blues, sometimes with swallowtails, um, definitely with the California tortoiseshells I showed you earlier. What they do is they land on damp soil and they soak up the salts and minerals through their proboscis. So here's a collection of different species of little blues uh, enjoying the damp mud. Now, how does a butterfly become a butterfly? I'm gonna use the monarch uh, to illustrate how it goes through this cycle, uh, but this is true for all butterfly species. They all go through this process. Uh, number one is that the female has to find her host plant. And in the case of the monarch, that means milkweed. Um, monarchs will not lay their eggs on anything other than milkweed. And we have different species of milkweed um, that they'll lay their eggs on, but it has to be milkweed. It can't be a thistle or yarrow or rose or anything else. Um, and that's true for all butterflies. They all have specific host plants. Some butterfly species maybe have a collection of host plants that they're willing to lay their eggs on, um, that they've evolved to lay their eggs on. But in the case of monarchs, it's just milkweed. Um, Monarchs will lay, typically the females will lay between 300 and 400, sometimes more eggs. Um, they lay them singly, as you can see. So that's my thumb in that photo for scale. You can see how teeny tiny the egg is. And then I took a picture just using my iPhone through a, a microscope to zoom in on the egg which is highlighted right here. And that dark coloration that you see at the top of the egg is actually the head of the caterpillar because it's just about ready to chomp its way out of its egg, which it has done here on this photo. So there is a teeny tiny caterpillar we call a mini cats. And if you look at the size of your pinky nail, it is smaller than the length of your pinky nail. These things are tiny. And in the span of two weeks, it grows from the size, you know, shorter than your pinky fingernail to as large as your entire index finger, uh, which is about 2000 times its original size. That is a pretty amazing feat for a caterpillar. And they're pretty cool looking. Um, they basically just eat <laughs> nonstop two weeks straight, and they do a lot of pooping too. 
Um, then when they're done growing, actually, let me just back up and mention, as they go through that process, um, they go through what are called different instar stages. So you might imagine as it's growing at this amazing rate, its skin starts to get really tight. And so it'll munch, 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 grow, skin gets tight, it'll shed that skin and it often eats the shed, and then it continues growing, skin gets tight again, sheds that skin, um, and continues on. And for the monarch, it goes through that uh, five times. So they have five instar stages. So in the fifth instar, instar stage, when they're done growing, they'll find a safe place to spin a little silk pad, which I'm pointing to with my arrow here, and they'll hang upside down. And we call this the J-hook phase, because it looks like a J. And it'll hang like this for 12 to 24 hours. You can see in this photo, here's some, just focus on these antenna. And you can see they're still pretty perky, you know. I say alert, that's not really the right word, but they're perky. Let's stick with that. And then right when it's ready to shed its final skin to reveal its chrysalis, you can see the antenna here at the bottom of the screen become flaccid. And when you see a caterpillar hanging in a jay with really flaccid antenna, you know it's about to shed its final skin. And this is the crazy thing. Some of you may have thought that um, butterflies in general like spin a chrysalis around them like a moth does. A moth spins a bunch of stuff around itself and creates what's called a cocoon. Butterflies create a chrysalis, but the chrysalis is in fact underneath its caterpillar skin, which is crazy <laughs> and really, really cool. So here is the sequence. The skin splits open. You can start to see the chrysalis and the, the caterpillar slash chrysalis is going through all these crazy herky jerky motions. It looks like it's going to fall off the branch when it's doing this because uh, it's so vigorous, but it, it scrunches around, gets that skin off, the skin drops down, and what is left is a perfectly formed chrysalis. And you can see up here, this is where the wings are going to start to develop. But inside, you can still see that caterpillar. And this is a super duper fresh, you know, just revealed chrysalis. Within 24 hours, it smooths out and hardens and looks like this, which to me, looks like a little nature jewel. It is incredible the amount of detail on these. Look at the beautiful little gold flex. And it has this line up here that I'm going to mention. I'll, I'll point out a couple slides from now what the butterfly does with that when it's ready to eclose. So let me go through the duration of each phase. As an egg, about five days. So then as a caterpillar for we talked about uh, two weeks, then it'll stay in its chrysalis um, anywhere typically from 10 to 12 days. That really can vary depending upon ambient temperatures. If it's super hot, you know, mid to high 90s, I've seen them eclose. Uh, the adults come out of their chrysalis um, in as short as eight or nine days. Um, but if it's really cool, like unseasonably cool, it could take a few weeks. Um, so when the butterfly excuse me, is about to come out. The chrysalis goes from being this glorious jade green color to being completely translucent. You can actually see the butterfly inside. You can see the fully formed wing right there. It is amazing. If you are lucky enough to find this out in nature, just plop down, sit down and watch because the magic is about to happen. Out comes the adult butterfly, and I mentioned that rim uh, that was on the chrysalis. It's a little harder to see in this picture, but the butterfly uses it actually to hang from, to get a grip on. Um, and you can see the wings when it first comes out of its chrysalis are all like crumpled up. They're, they're sort of shrunken, they're, they're small because they had to fit in that tiny little chrysalis. And the abdomen over here is really chunky. So what it does over the course of the next half hour to hour is it pumps. It actually, you can watch it contracting uh, its belly, its, its abdomen. It's pumping fluids from that part of its body out into the wings, through the veins, and the wings expand right in front of your eyes. It is amazing. And once they reach their full 
uh, the, full, the full size, then the butterfly just kind of hangs there and it dries out its wings. It gives its wings a chance to harden. It moves them kind of slowly around um, the whole process from the time it comes out of the chrysalis until it's ready to fly is typically several hours. And that's what it looks like when it's ready to go. Here's a little quiz for you. Is that a male or a female? That's my daughter, Lucy. <laughs> that is a female butterfly because you can see she has really nice uh, dark, thick veins and no dots. Okay. So once a butterfly is an adult, then it will go about finding a mate uh, and laying eggs and continuing the cycle. Um, here in Central Oregon, things get pretty cold in the winter. So what's a butterfly going to do? <laughs> How's it going to spend its winter? Well, the different butterfly species we have here actually have all sorts of different strategies uh, for making it through. Some do it as an egg. Some go through the winter as a caterpillar, is one of the instar stages. Some will go through the winter as a chrysalis um, and others as an adult. And some of the ones that go through the winter as an adult here are the California tortoise shells, which you saw a picture of, and also morning cloaks. Um, we have several other ones, but those are the most common two that you might see flitting around on a unseasonably warm winter's day. So like if it gets up into the 50s or 60s and you see a butterfly flitting around, probably a tortoise shell or a morning cloak. Well, the monarch doesn't do any of these things. The monarch gets out of town because this is a tropical butterfly species and it doesn't have any interest <laughs> in trying to survive a winter here in central Oregon. So what the monarch does is it migrates. And this is what makes it so, so amazing. So this map shows you the United States. Um, it's, it's kind of a simplified version of what happens, um, but it's a really good one for illustrating. So on the east side of the Rocky Mountains, these monarchs are called our eastern monarchs. The monarchs on the west side of the Rocky Mountains are called the western monarchs. They are genetically identical, um, but we just have these different names for them because they go to different places to spend the winter. The ones on the east side uh, primarily go down to the central highlands of Mexico, and the ones uh, in the west, our monarchs that we see here in central Oregon, they migrate to uh, the central coast of California. Um, there is a little crossover that happens and some mixing and mingling, but in general, that's the directions that they're going. And the things that they're queuing into in the fall, like why does the monarch even, like how does it know to move? Typically because the temperatures are getting cooler, the nights are getting longer, days are getting shorter, uh, and the plants that they rely on for laying eggs and for nectaring um, are starting to senesce. And so they're like, oh, time to go. So let me show you a couple of pictures of overwintering sites. So this is one from California. Again, all up and down really the California coast, but primarily the central coast. Um, and they're roosting in um, eucalyptus and cypress and palm trees right up along the ocean. And the reason why they're targeting those areas is because it's cool and moist. So they can slow down their metabolism, live off their reserves, and they don't get dehydrated. They don't get dried out because of all the moisture in the air. Uh, in the case of Eastern Monarchs, they're going to Mexico to the Central Highlands, like I mentioned, and they're roosting about 10,000 feet in elevation in Oyamal fir trees, um, again, because it's cool and moist. And one of the really cool things about the monarchs in Mexico, their arrival um, in late October, early November coincides with the Day of the Dead celebrations. And so for centuries, um, they have been revered and celebrated as the returning spirits of their ancestors, which I think is amazing. So after the winter, days start getting longer, uh, temperatures are warming up, flowers are starting to bloom, milkweed is starting to come up, and the butterflies feel like it's time to go. It's time to start migrating back north. So those butterflies that have spent the entire winter in their overwintering grounds will get restless. They'll leave their overwintering grounds, go maybe a little inland, a little farther north, and they'll mate, lay eggs, and die. Then a next generation comes out. So you've got your egg, caterpillar, chrysalis, and new adult, those adults fly a little farther north and they mate 
and lay eggs and die. And each of these subsequent generations is basically leapfrogging, moving farther and farther north. It could take up to five generations to get from Mexico to Canada. Um, out west here, it might be more like three or four generations. Um, just kind of depends on how far north they're going to go in a particular year. Um, and each one of those generations only lives between two and five weeks because their job is kind of short. Their, their goal is to move a little bit north, find a mate, lay eggs, and die. What's amazing is that at the end of the summer, the super generation is born, for lack of a better word, and these monarchs are actually bigger, and they assimilate nutrients in a different way. Um, and these are the ones that then cue into the fall, you know, the environmental cues, and know that it is their job to fly all the way south and to live six to nine months. It's part of the magic. How is this possible that they know where to go even though there are many generations removed? You know, it's not like birds um, which go back and forth, you know, year after year. They've never been there, but they get there. They know where to go. It's amazing. Unfortunately, our monarchs are facing uh, a lot of challenges. Uh, my daughter drew this a couple years ago uh, when she was 12 to represent um, how I feel <laughs> about and how a lot of people feel about the severe decline in the monarch population. Um, speaking for Western monarchs, for every 160 monarchs we used to have overwintering on the California coast, we now have one. We've gone from overwintering populations in the millions to fewer than 30,000. Uh, the Xerces Society um, is an organization that um, their organization is all about invertebrate conservation and they've been studying western monarchs in the overwintering grounds for many many years in california um, and we won't really know uh, what the pulse is for this year's population until they do their overwintering counts um, you know later this year but for the past two years in a row the numbers have been uh, fewer than thirty thousand. why uh, a lot of reasons um, Loss of overwintering habitat as development pressures increase on those overwintering grounds where they hang out. Climate change is a big one. Um, increased severity of winter storms. Um, and also the fact that it, war it often warms up uh, earlier than it has in the past. And so the monarchs will start to move around and think it's time to mate and migrate. Um, and there won't be enough food for them. Uh, the plants won't be... Um, you know, doing the thing that they do in the spring, uh, emerging and blooming. Um, also, loss of milkweed all throughout their migration and breeding corridors. Um, and also the use uh, of pesticides, specifically neonicotinoids, uh, which is a pretty nasty chemical. It's systemic. Uh, so when it is applied to plants, it gets into the plant tissue. It is expressed through nectar and pollen. So any critter munching on a plant that's been treated with neonicotinoids um, will either die or reproductively it won't be as successful. Um, all kinds of bad things can happen and unfortunately it's a really commonly used chemical. But I'm not a person that likes to dwell on the bad stuff. Let's talk about what we can do to help the monarchs. There's a lot of stuff we can do and some pretty simple stuff. This is one of the wonderful, hopeful things about monarchs. Um, they, they're such an iconic species and one that we can all really galvanize around. And I think what's so wonderful is that it's super duper easy to help. How? Plant some milkweed. <laughs> Here in Central Oregon, we have two types of native milkweed. We have showy milkweed. Uh, when it's a full mature plant, it looks like this. It takes a couple years to get to this full glory. Um, but I have this little inset picture here just to remind me to let you know that milkweed is not only enjoyed by monarchs. It's actually visited by many pollinator species, including bees. So it's a great thing to put in a container on your doorstep or in a raised bed, or if you have more space, <clears throat> excuse me, and you have a backyard, you can plant it directly in your garden. The land trust will send for free 
showy milkweed seeds to anybody in our region. All you have to do is get on our website and fill out the form and we'll send you some showy milkweed. And we're able to do this because of a partnership we have with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the Deschutes National Forest. So we're really excited to be able to help spread milkweed. Um, our other native milkweed is narrow leaf milkweed. Unfortunately, we don't have any seed um, of this species, but you can often get it at Winter Creek, uh, which is a nat uh, native nursery in Bend. Um, this is what narrow leaf looks like. It has narrow leaves, like the name suggests, um, and it is also favored by, by monarchs. And my suggestion is actually to plant both of these if you can, if you have the space. If you could plant like you know, three to six of both kinds and cluster them together in a container pot or a raised bed, like I said, or in your garden. Um, that is the best way to help. Uh, if you have a little more space, you can plant other pollinator friendly native plant species. Again, we have lots more resources um, on our website, DeschutesLandTrust.org. Um, when you're planting other species, a couple of things to focus on are to plant in clumps, um, so that the pollinators that are coming to visit don't have to travel very far to find the plants. Um, and also to plant a variety of blooms, uh, things that bloom all the way from April through October. Um, obviously not the same plant, maybe blooming that entire time, but just a collection of different plants that give you something uh, that's blooming at all times in your yard. And that will attract a lot of different varieties of pollinators and ensure that no matter what time of the year somebody's visiting your garden, there's something there to feed on. So if you're not super into gardening, that's okay. There are other ways to get involved. Um, Monarch, uh, Western Monarch Advocates is a recent, uh, recent organization. We've only been around for a couple of years. Uh, last year, we hosted our first ever Western Monarch Summit down in California, which was really exciting. And this year, uh, largely due to COVID, um, we've, we've channeled our energies uh, online, uh, which is a safer place for folks to meet and exchange information. And I really encourage you to check out this incredible website um, and to click on the state updates page, uh, which you'll see as so you just type in Western Monarch Advocates into Google and it'll take you there. Um, lots of incredible information. You can find out what's happening in different states um, and what different folks are doing. If, if you live in a different area um, and you're curious what's going on in your area, this is definitely the place to go to find out more. It also provides lots of great links to other organizations that are working really hard uh, in the field of monarch conservation. Um, and if you're interested in citizen science, this is a really great way to get involved. This is something that the Xerces Society uh, put together and it's a milkweed and monarch mapper. And it's pretty intuitive. All the orange dots are places where people have seen monarchs. All the green dots are places where people have seen milkweed. And all of the purplish dots are where they have seen evidence of uh, reproduction, so eggs or caterpillars. Um, so if you're fortunate enough to see a monarch or stumble across a caterpillar or an egg, if you snap a photo and go to this website, you can log in and provide another data point, uh, which is really, really important as we're trying to learn more about how the species moves around the West um, and maybe where pockets are where we need more milkweed, um, that sort of thing. So with that, I'll wrap it up and leave it up to any questions. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful opportunity to chat with you. Thank you so much, Amanda. That is fascinating, 130 species of butterflies. That's crazy. <laughs> and I'm so happy to know that there's like an easy way to tell the male and females apart. And I was really happy when I got it right. That one thing. <laughs> and that's great news about the milkweed. Um, yeah, it's, it's nice to have some action items of things that we can do instead of just being sad. Because <laughs> they are I amazing. That's, that's how I feel. I, it's, it's hard. There's so much negative news these days and it's just overwhelming. You don't know what you can do. In this case, I feel like there's something very concrete you can do. <laughs> right. 
Now, is this, are the milkweeds, um, are they something that you plant in the fall or are they something you plant in the spring? In, in our area, it's really best um, to try to get them going in the spring. So if you were to contact the land trust and ask for some showy milkweed seed, we can totally send it to you now. Um, but it's far enough along in the summer, you know, and, and August gets pretty hot around here. It's hard to get something established. Um, at this point, if you go to Winter Creek and you get a mature plant, I mean, even then it's a rugged time, unless you have a really constant water source, it'll be hard to get it established at this point. Um, you could try. Uh, what I would do though, is just get some seed and, and I like to start the seed in a little pot, um, mm -hmm. on a sunny windowsill in the early spring and let it grow indoors for a while. Um, mm -hmm and then transfer it out to, you know, I have mine in a raised bed. Um, they do spread rhizomatously once they get established. And that means they're, so their roots go down, but then they start to spread sideways and shoot up other mm. plants. So ultimately milkweed will reprodu reproduce via seed. Um, and it has mm -hmm. these seed pods and the seed will blow around, but it also reproduces rhizomatously. Um, and if people don't want it spreading throughout their garden, a raised bed is a great way to go. Okay. Great to know. So it's like a, it's, it's like the strawberry plant in terms of just going out and growing, but I'm sure the butterflies would love that. It, they, they would. And it, honestly, it takes years before that happens. It's, <laughs> yeah. And a friend of mine got one of those wildflower packets too. Um, but I've heard pros and cons against those with our native species. Exactly. It's really great if you can focus on just the natives. And um, the challenge with wildflower packets, it depends, I guess, on, on where you get them. Um, but it's like, what is the seed source? So if the seed is coming from some other state, um, or even elsewhere in Oregon that has a different climate, um, you're not going to have as high survival rate. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really better just to grow locally adapted plants. They won't need as much water once they get established, which is really helpful, especially for our desert region. So I would really recommend, like if you want to have a little wildflower packet and put it in a container pot, you know, just to enjoy the beauty of that, that's fine. But when it comes to, you know, landscaping and really trying to benefit our local pollinator species that are in decline, it's best to go with native. And we have a, a great spreadsheet on our website uh, that folks can find that um, outlines all kinds of native pollinator friendly plants for central Oregon. And it lists all the different bloom times and the different bloom colors. So you can kind of pick and choose from that. Yeah, because it's so fun about having a garden, if you do garden, that that something is always blooming yep. and it's beneficial to look at for us and for the butterflies. Yep. Yeah. One last question. I have heard different things about bees um, liking little water sources. Do butterflies like that too? Absolutely. Yeah. It's really nice. This kind of happens naturally if you do water, like if you have some irrigation in your yard, um, you naturally create moist areas, you know, depending upon what your water schedule is and the butterflies can, you know, mm -hmm. land in those areas and sip up salts and minerals. Um, but absolutely the butterflies need what the bees need and that's, you know, shelter, uh, nectar resources, uh, water for sure. Mm. Well, this is really fun. I I learned so much about butterflies and they're hey. so great. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> so thank you for joining us and please check out Deschutes Land Trust um, and get yourself some showy milkweed to plant next spring. Yeah. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you.